We are going to start today with a spiritual pop quiz. You ready for this? Remember that moment when you're, you sit down at your desk in the classroom and you look up at the board and it says pop quiz today and anxiety just fills your body? Test anxiety's just filled the whole room. It's going to be okay. We're going to be all right. It's one question, although it is a pass or fail type situation. All right, here's the question. Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? How would you answer that? In fact, on your outline, if you have a paper outline or on the app, on your outline, there is a statement that says, Jesus is blank. I want you to take the next 10 seconds and fill that out. <laughs> so how did you answer that question? You may be, maybe you're thinking Jesus is Lord or Jesus is God or Jesus is the Messiah or the Savior. Or maybe you looked at the compassion of Jesus and you said, man, look at his character. He's loving. He's forgiving. He sees the needs of others. By the way, all of those are right. Gold stars for everybody, okay? But here's the question behind the question. Though we know these things to be true, are we living from that truth? You see, belief is far more than just the words that we speak. The way that we live our lives reveals what we truly believe about God, ourselves, and others. You and I are a living theology. What we really believe about God shows up in how we live our life. Let me give an example. If you wrote down, as I did, Jesus is forgiving. When you blow it, when you fail, when you wander in sin, do you run to him for forgiveness or do you run from him in hiddenness? You see, if we truly believe that Jesus is forgiving, we'll want to run to him, not from him. Or if you believe that Jesus is the source of life, why is it so difficult for so many to have a daily, regular rhythm of gaining that nourishing life from Jesus in a quiet time with him? You see, belief is far more than intellectual assent. And today we're beginning a sermon series through the book of John called I Am. And we're going to be looking at who Jesus claims he is. And my hope for you and I during this series is that we would align our beliefs about Jesus with who he says he is, not who I think he is or who somebody else told me he is or who I heard he is on this podcast or this sermon, but we would go to the very words of Jesus and say, does what he say match where I'm living? I just want to pause. It's hard to look at areas of unbelief in our life or shallow belief in our life. But I want us to be open to the question today. Is it possible that I'm not living from correct belief about Jesus? And we're actually going to be looking at a story today from John 8, where the, the audience there that Jesus is interacting with, they think they have all their theological ducks in a row. They think they've got it all figured out. And Jesus reveals their unbelief. Now, a little bit of background to this, uh, to this passage in John 8. The Feast of Tabernacles has just concluded. Jesus was there during this feast. This was a, a, a regular yearly feast where they would celebrate the goodness of God in bringing them out of slavery in Egypt and providing for them along the way. The Jews were in slavery for 430 years in Egypt. This was a yearly reminder of the goodness of God. They would have a ceremony where they would have torches and they would remember God as a pillar of fire. And then they'd have a water ceremony, remembering when God provided water miraculously for his people. And they would, they would build these little huts or tents out of, uh, out of tree branches and they would live in them as a reminder of this period in their history. It was for all generations who came after them to remember the goodness of God and his faithfulness as he led his people by their hand through the difficulty. And Jesus is there during this celebration and he's making some audacious claims about himself. I am the light of the world. 
he says. We're actually going to study that later on in this series. But he makes these claims and it begins to enrage the Jewish leaders that are there. They're like, who's this guy? Are you kidding me? Like, this guy's a nobody, right? Oh, he's from a no-name town. And frankly, we don't even know who his daddy is. Like, I'm pretty sure he's just going to lead people astray. They say, but we, us, us leaders, we're the elite. We descended from Abraham. And Jesus tells them something that's very hard for them to hear. They say, you keep, he says, you keep saying your father's Abraham, but the reality is your spiritual father is Satan. And this just incenses and enrages them all the more. And at this point, they're in a murderous rage. They want to kill Jesus. And Jesus says, look, I'm telling you the truth. Like if I tell you the truth, why don't you believe me? And that's where we pick up this story in John chapter eight, starting in verse 45. He says, Jesus says, but because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Jesus is saying, I'm giving you unadulterated truth. This is reality. Why don't you believe me? You see, even though this conversation with the Jews gets heated, I don't believe Jesus was being antagonistic. I think this is the heart of the Savior. I'm telling you the truth. Turn from your father, Satan, and come to me. Why don't you believe me? And then he asks an audacious question. He says, which one of you convicts me of sin? (laughs) What? He's in the temple courts. There's a crowd there gathered. Are you kidding me? Who, like put yourself in Jesus' shoes. How many of you want to come up on this platform and ask the whole church, hey, can anyone point out a sin I've ever walked in? Like that, no way, right? We got baggage. We're messed up people. But Jesus, he's before this crowd. And he says, can anybody prove that I've sinned? And the answer is met with silence. No, no, we can't. Because Jesus is in fact the sinless one. And then he goes on. If I tell you the truth, why don't you believe me? You can't convict me of sin. I'm telling you the truth. Why do you not believe me? And then he answers his own question. Whoever is of God, hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. What? This is getting toe to toe now. Jesus just told these Jewish leaders, you're not of God. Can you imagine what they felt in that moment? We've got the temple. We've got the law. We hold the feasts. We have the the religious upbringing. Who are you to come and tell me we're not of God? And the debate continues on. The Jews answered him, are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? This devolves into playground economics, right? They're just hurling insults at Jesus at this point. The Samaritans were were a, were a hated people group by the Jews. The Samaritans had, during an exile, intermarried with some of the pagan nations around them. And so uh, they had taken worship of the true God and intermingled it with some pagan worship. And now they had this kind of hybrid religion. And so the Jews viewed them as heretics and half-breeds. And during Jesus' day, there were several Samaritan messiahs. There were false messiahs who would gather disciples to themselves for their own prideful edification and lead people astray. And so they're saying, look, Jesus, you're just like those Samaritans who gather people to themselves for their own glory, for their own pride. You're just going to lead us astray. But more than that, they say, you have a demon. What? What? They say God is demon possessed. Like it's shameful to me that God even had to answer this, right? Look at Jesus's response. He ignores their racially insensitive slur about being a Samaritan, but he, he says, I do not have a demon. Like it's, it's amazing to me that God even put up with that question. But I think it shows Jesus is trying to draw out. You're not believing. Your words sound right, but your heart is far from God. You don't know God. I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. Yet I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it. He is the judge. Jesus says, I'm not here to glorify myself. I'm here to glorify the father. You're claiming that I'm like one of those Samaritans who pridefully seeks his own glory. I'm here to glorify my father who is in heaven. And then Jesus says, truly, truly. Anytime Jesus says that, that should be like alarm bells going off. Listen up. 
This is important. What I'm about to say to you is very serious. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. What? (laughs) So Jesus is saying, your father's Satan. My father is God. Oh yeah, and I have the power over life and death. Can you put yourself in the leaders of the, the Jews at this moment? Like, come on, man. How do you have the power over? This is an audacious claim. And I want to pause here for a moment. <clears throat> when he says, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. This is not, Jesus is not teaching a works-based salvation. He's not saying, do this, you're saved. We know because in John 3, it says, believe and you'll have eternal life. In John 1, it says, believe and receive and you will be given the right to become a child of God. This is evidence of faith. But the Jews can't handle it. The Jews say to him, now we know you have a demon. Like we were suspicious before, but now we know. Go get the exorcist. Let's do this thing right here in the temple courts. They say, Abraham died, as did the prophets. Yet you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham who died and the prophets died? Who do you make yourself out to be? They're saying, look, Abraham, the revered patriarch, the one that we're all looking to for our spiritual lineage, even that godly man died. The prophets who spoke the truth of God, sometimes in very extreme, adverse circumstances, godly men died. Do you claim to be greater than them? Who do you make yourself out to be? Who do you make yourself out to be? That's the question we're wrestling with in this series. Who is Jesus? Who do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my father who glorifies me of whom you say he is our God. He says, look, you say the father is your God, but he's going to reiterate here, but you have not known him. And that known there in the original is an experiential knowing. It is a place where you're living from relationship, living from knowing God. It's not just intellectual ascent. He's saying, look, you've got the right words, but there's no evidence in your life of it. You have not known him. I know him. If I were to say, I do not know him, I'd be a liar like you. (laughs) Jesus gets the teeth out, right? He's giving him hard truth. I'd be a liar like you. But I do know him and I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, you're not yet 50 years old. And have you seen Abraham? He says, your father Abraham, the one that you're claiming spiritual lineage to, he looked to me. You're looking to Abraham. He looked to me. You're looking to your family tree. You should be looking to me. And scholars are totally split on what exactly this means that he saw it and was glad. The reality is Abraham lived 2000 years before Jesus, right? And so they're confused. They're saying, Jesus, are you claiming that that, that you have seen Abraham and Abraham seen you? Like you're not even 50 yet, which by the way, guys, he's in his early thirties. Give him his time. All right. I'm 35. I don't want you to say, well, you're not quite 50. Okay. But they're saying, look, Abraham how did he rejoice and see your day? It'd be like uh, me saying, yeah, I was here when Jesus was here about 2000 years ago. Uh, We went to dinner at Matthew's house and had some unleavened bread. It was real good, fun time. Like it's an insane claim, right? But they're, they're, they're questioning, understandably so. You're not yet 50. How did Abraham see you? Now, Jesus is about to make what I believe is the most outrageous claim in the entirety of his ministry. Jesus said to them, truly, truly. Remember that's listen. This is important. Truly, truly. I say to you before Abraham was, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. Now that's not bad grammar. You may be thinking to yourself, Jesus, I just took a pop quiz and aced it. Let me give you some help here. But that's, that's not bad grammar. Jesus is making a claim here. This is a claim of his deity. 
There are many views of Jesus that just say he's a good teacher or he was an intellectual or, or he was a lunatic or a liar. But many people will say, Jesus never claimed to be God. This right here is his claim to deity. This harkens back to a story in Exodus where God was going to set his people free and a guy named Moses. See, Moses was a murderer who ran because he was afraid he was going to be caught for his crime and fled and hid in the desert. He eventually married and took care of the flocks of his father-in-law. And one day he's out in the desert tending to the flocks and a bush is on fire, which is not uncommon in the desert. But this bush is different. Though it's on fire, it is not turning to ash. It's not being consumed. And so he goes to check it out. It's like, this is not normal. And God begins to speak to him through the bush. God begins to tell him that he saw the cry of his people, that they're in bondage and slavery. And so he, he's going to set them free. And he said, Moses, you're going to be a part of this story. And Moses has every excuse in the book. I don't speak well. I can't do this. Please, if there's anybody else on the whole planet, send them, not me. Eventually, after some heated back and forth between God and Moses, Moses consents and Moses says, okay, but, but who am I supposed to say sent me? Like, I can't go to the leaders of Israel and to the Pharaoh of Egypt and say, um, let my people go. Thus saith the bush. Like, that's not going to work, right? Right? Like, what, in this day, the name of your God revealed something of the character of your God. And so he says, who, who should I say sent me? And God says, tell them, I am has sent you. And this is his title that speaks of his eternality, of his self-sufficiency, of his covenant promise. This is the name of God. It was a sacred name that the Jews were afraid to even say. And so the I am is the God who brought his people with a strong hand out of Egypt. The I am is the God who uh, prepared a way in the desert. The I am is the one who they went through the Red Sea on dry ground. And Jesus in the temple courts is claiming, I am that God. Oh no. <laughs> you see the Jewish leaders, they have two options really here. Jesus is claiming deity. He's claiming, I am the God you claim to worship. Come to me. They can throw themselves at his feet or they can pick up stones and throw stones at him. And we see, so they picked up stones to throw at him, but he hid himself and went out of the temple. Do you see that last line? Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. God had to hide himself in his own house from the people he came to save. That's insane to me. There's a few things that I want us to lean into that I think we can learn from this story about belief and how to truly live from correct belief about Jesus. The first thing I want you to see from this story is belief is revealed by behavior. Belief is revealed by behavior. Remember, we can have all the right words and all the wrong beliefs. Let's look at it again in the passage. So just a chapter earlier from the story we just read, the same crowd is there. And what does it say? Many of the people believed in him. They said, when the Christ appears, will he do more signs than this man has done? This has got to be him. Like he's proven himself to us. And the word there, believed, connotes an intellectual assent. They said, yeah, he fits the bill. The same crowd, a chapter later, pick up stones to throw at him. They had a confession of belief, but their behavior doesn't match it. Our beliefs are revealed by our behaviors. What we truly believe is how we live. What we believe about God, ourselves, and others. It's revealed in our behaviors. Several years ago, my kids, my family, and I, we lived in a two-bedroom apartment, all five of us. It was kind of nuts. And we were on the third story 
And my son is a little barbarian, right? He, he has no fear. He's the kid I want to wrap in bubble wrap. I'm, so, I'm amazed he hasn't broken something. That's the grace of God on his life, apparently. And so he, but he has no fear. And we're three stories up. And the windows don't have any sort of uh, protection in case anybody, anything was to fall out or anybody was to fall out. And so I opened the windows to get a breeze going through the house. And I told him, buddy, stay away from the windows. This is not where we play right now, okay? We're trying to cool down the house. You could hurt yourself. And he says, okay, dad. And I go to the kitchen and I start making some food. And out of the corner of my eye, I see him barreling through the living room, ah, like Tarzan on the vine, running straight towards the window we just talked about. And it's like this slow motion moment in my mind. And I start running into the living room to stop him from what I know is about to happen. He gets to the window, pops that screen out, and it begins to fall. I reach out, grab him by the diaper. Okay, it was Huggies brand diapers. Huggies is the sponsor of this sermon, okay? If you ever need a diaper to save your life, it's Huggies. And I pull him back in and I'm like, bud, I, we just talked about this. He had the right information. It didn't impact his experience. It didn't impact his life. He didn't, there was no change. He didn't really believe me that there was danger there. Here's the question I want you to wrestle with. Where in your life are you not believing God? That though you have the right words, the truth has not penetrated your heart. You're not living from that reality. The Jews here reveal they don't truly believe. Though many of them, it says, believed in him. Here they are ready to kill him. Where are you not believing Jesus and who you are as a result of who he is? I've got to be honest with you, as I have evaluated this for myself, it's tough. It's hard to look at the truth sometimes. Jesus revealed hard truth to these people. And I believe through this series, he wants to re maybe reveal some hard truths to us, some areas where we don't believe him. And as I evaluated um, for myself, I've been doing this thing called listening prayer. I just spend 15 minutes a day where I'm silent and I just listen for the voice of God. And I told my wife, like, Every time I come to listening prayer, I, I feel like God says, I love you. And I told her, God's got to have something else to say. Like he's got to have a list for me to do or people to go pray for or, or go start this ministry or go do this thing. He's got to have more than just, I love you. And I wasn't believing it. And she, she's in a moment of extreme wisdom. She said, yeah, but Jason, you really need to hear that because you don't believe it. And now I'm just a ball of tears, right? I'm learning this with you. What areas do you struggle to believe God? Though we know the truth, is it your experience? Is it where you're living from? Is it a deeply rooted thing in your life? You see, often in Christianity, what we tend to do is address behaviors. And when we just address the behavior and say, I'm gonna make a change, I won't do this again, but we never get down to the deeper rooted beliefs that are fueling those behaviors. We'll just continue to walk in the same patterns. It's insanity because behavior is a fruit of what we believe. And so we have to do the hard work to say, this is what's coming out of me. What am I believing as a result of this behavior I'm seeing? Now this begs the question for me though. Okay. I, I know there's areas I need to change. Maybe even now God has shown you, like I need to change this about how I believe about Jesus. How do you change your belief? I think Jesus answers this question with this. Belief is a choice. Last week at the Easter service, it was awesome to be there with you guys, by the way. It's so encouraging. But last week at the Easter service, Pastor Paul gave an amazing message of which I only heard one line. <laughs> Because God, I believe, spoke to me. He, Pastor Paul said, belief is a choice. And that just rung out in my head. It's a choice. We get to choose where to place our faith. And when we realize we're living from a lie, we can choose the truth. Look at what Jesus says to the leaders. If I tell you the truth, why don't you believe me? There's a choice to be made here. 
You can choose to continue to live in the lie or you can choose to live according to the truth. So where do you need to choose the truth over a lie? Coming back to where we started, everybody here has a place where they need to choose the truth over a lie. None of us are exempt. Where do you need to choose the truth? I'd like to close with the story about why this is so important. My wife and I were counseling a young girl who we had just seen go through a fit of anger and rage and uh, lashing out on people and it was sin. So we, we pulled her aside and we sat down and just asked some questions. And eventually we asked, what, what do you believe about God? And she, she didn't understand what we were trying to get at. And so we said, when God looks at you, this is a question I've learned from Pastor Ed. When God looks at you, what's the expression on his face? Is he excited to see you? Is he joyful and happy that you're his child? Is he impatient? Is he frustrated? Is he angry? And without hesitation, she said, when God looks at me, he's really mad at me. And I said, oh, what, why do you believe that? She said, without hesitation, because I'm a very mean person. And we began to draw out, well, what, where do you see that in your life? And she began to sh- share their areas of sin. She was right there. There are areas where she's lashing out in anger. And then I said, no, what, what does the Bible say about you? What does the Bible say about God's love for sinners? And, and she said, God loves me. God forgives me. She quoted Romans 8, 38. She knows the truth. She's just not experiencing it. She's not living from it. She knows it. She just doesn't believe it. It's not coming out in her life. Our beliefs are revealed by our behaviors. And this girl has an angry God. So she's an angry person. And what's hard for me is that girl is my youngest daughter, Audra. And she has given me permission to share this. But as I've watched her wrestle with the love of God, I realized where she's modeling relationship from. You see, I've never taught my kids that God is a, a, an angry God or hates them or is evil or doesn't love them. I've taught them the opposite of those things, but they've seen my relationship with God and they're modeling their relationship after me. And it broke my heart because I'm here with my daughter trying to say, don't you see God loves you? Can't you see that? And at the same time, God is saying the same thing to me. Belief is a choice. And the the reason why this matters so much is because if we don't align our beliefs with who Jesus says he is and who you and I are as a result of that, it will impact our mission field. Parents, this matters so much. Your kids are watching you more than just the Bible studies, more than just the devotions, more than the time around scripture. That's great. Continue that. They're watching your life beyond that and seeing does everything you're living match up? And I can tell you, if we don't have the right belief in our heart, not just intellectual ascent, but in our hearts, we don't live from that. It will impact your mission field in your home. It will impact the mission field in your workplace or the marketplace or at the school or wherever you go. If we want to be people helping people find and follow Jesus, if we want to be disciples making disciples, if we want to have kingdom impact, we must align our beliefs with who Jesus says he is, not who we think he is because we get it twisted. We can have a false filter over Jesus because of our own brokenness. So we have to do the hard work to say, where am I not truly believing this? Recognize the lie and replace it with the truth. That's my hope for us during this series. I hope you're here to join us for the whole thing. I love you. Jesus loves you. I'm going to release to the campus pastors. Thank you guys so much for joining us. It was an awesome privilege to be here with you today and for our transformational moment. We don't ever just want to hear a message and do nothing about it. We want to change. We're about life change. And so we want to challenge you, right? 
to be here with us throughout the entirety of the I Am series as we look at not just who we think Jesus is, but who he claimed himself to be. And we have this tool that is called fruit to root. It's, it's a picture of a tree. And on one side, you express the fruit that you are experiencing in your life. And then you ask yourself the difficult questions. What am I believing about myself? And what am I believing about God that's leading to this fruit coming out in our life? And then at the bottom of the tree, there's this arrow. That's the repentance moment. There's a confession of sin, repentance, and then you confess the truth. What's true about God? What's true about myself? And as a result of those truths, what am I now experiencing? I hope that this process begins to happen as we walk through who Jesus claimed himself to be. And then lastly, want to make sure that we do our multiplication moment. As we've just gone through Easter, and maybe you got to invite somebody, maybe you've got to build relationship with a few people as they came to Easter service. We've been going through this bless strategy, beginning with prayer, that we ask every day, God, show me where you're working in the world and help me to join you in that. And now we're, we're focusing in on listen, that we would actively listen to learn other people's stories to hear what God is doing in their life, to hear the gospel that they believe and to share the gospel as appropriate as we listen to what God is doing in their heart and in their life. So we want to challenge you. If you brought somebody to Easter, follow up with a conversation. Ask them, what did you hear at Easter? What, what was God speaking to you? What did you think about the service? These are simple questions that you can have to hear what's going on in their heart and in their life. We love you guys. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a great week.